It reminded me of the prochet of what heaven will be like when all of God's people from every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, every color will come together in the presence of Yahweh to praise Him for who He is and for what He has done. This is dress rehearsal. What do you say? For that great day, somebody said, well, I don't like noise. Well, then don't plan to make it to heaven. Because <clears throat> when I think about the goodness of God and all My soul helped me preach my little sermon. Matter of fact, I haven't started yet, but I like it. Yeah, work with me today. <laughs> my soul. Can you imagine when we make it to heaven, the first thing I think about is that I don't have to pay the rent. <laughs> the mortgage. I, I have a little saying, me and my relatives, when, whenever they call and they say, what's going on? I say, it's the rent. The rent. And somebody's got to pay it. But I can't wait to get to heaven. What a day. What a day. I, I, I just want to let you know that you have a lot to be proud of. I've been a part of of this great church of the living God, but especially this community here at 4555 Fairfields Avenue. Our children are doing us proud. Uh, Minister Bree, well, let me call her full name. Minister Breon Fontenet. See, she, she, she was asked to do the Student Week of Prayer at our school, the MLK Junior Christian Academy. And, and what an awesome ministry that was. She was there every day this week. And my wife and I came on Friday morning to the closing to support. And the young people, the blessing, and we made an appeal. And there were many students who raised their hand, actually stood up for baptism. And the principal Jordan and her team will get their names and turn it over to me and Pastor Footman. And we're going to contact the parents of those young people. And we're going to set up uh, Bible studies in the home because we don't just want the children, we want the whole family. I, I can't get no help with that. And, and so we, we are excited, great, we're proud of you, and bless God for your ministry. And now you know the, the school is raising funds to put a playground out. We've been announcing it, it's $9,000. And, uh, so we need to help them. Uh, some of you are already contributing. And I'm not going to call your names, but I was there and they said it. And you know I like to talk, so you got to be careful what you say around me. Especially if you don't caution me that it is private, personal, and pastoral confidence. You got to always tell me that. You got to tell me that, Pastor, I'm speaking to you in confidence because I get paid to talk the more I talk. <clears throat> but, but some of you, some of you are giving uh, from this church and we bless God for you. Um, and we, we are going to, we're going to contribute. Um, I'm going to speak to the church board and we're going to make a contribution to that project because if the school looks good, we look good. What do you say? Amen. It is our school and we are part
part of it that we have to encourage the young people. I want you to take your Bibles first to the stand so we can acknowledge that we're in the presence of Yahweh when we read his word. Now today, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to do what everybody I'm not going to preach. I, I want to teach. Uh, matter of fact, the Lord is leading me in that direction. Uh, next year, we're going to do a series of teachings. And so we want you to get ready to come to learn together, study together. And, and, and next year, when we're doing our, pre our teaching, you'll be able to interrupt me and ask questions. Uh, you see how quiet you got now? <laughs> oh, Pastor, we come to church to preach. It's not Sabbath school. Well, I know that. But we've had enough preaching. We need to do some teaching so the word can germinate, so we can go out and work, so the kingdom can grow. What do you say? Amen. Pick up your Bibles or whatever you carry your word on and hold it in your hand and say after me, I hold in my hand the keys to the kingdom, the word of God, the authority of God, and whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever I loose on earth will be loosed in heaven in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now say it like you mean it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yahweh, the hour is coming in that your son, Yeshua, others call you Jesus, must be lifted up. For Yeshua said, and I, if I be lifted up, I, Yeshua, will draw men, all women, all boys and all girls unto me. So lift Jesus up right now. May Jesus be seen clearly. May Jesus be heard and understood without any ambiguity. And when this experience shall have come to a pause, may Yeshua be honored. May Yeshua be obeyed. Thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory forever. And the people of God say amen, amen, amen and amen. I want to call your attention to two passages of scripture. Uh, the first is our preaching passage. It's from the Gospel according to John. The Gospel according to John. The third chapter, very familiar passage. John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 7. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. And then we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3 as well. And we're going to look at verse 27. Galatians 3, 27, but first, John chapter number 3, and verses 5 through 7. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say wait for me. Okay, we're waiting 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. All right, we should all have it. John chapter number 3 beginning with verse number five. And it reads thus, and Jesus, what? Answering said, what? Verily, verily, I say unto you, what? Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he what? He cannot enter the kingdom of of God. That's a, that's a profound and provocative statement. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6 says, that which is what? Born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is what? Born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto you what? He must be born again. Now let's go to 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27. Do you have it? Amen. Amen. Let's read together. For as what? Many of you as have been what? Baptized in Christ Jesus have done what? Put on Christ. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For as many of you as have been baptized in Christ Jesus, you have put on Christ. If I were to put a tag on this teaching, this study, this morning, it would be baptism. The uh, necessary and uh, the necessary ritual with eternal implications. Baptism. The necessary ritual with eternal implications. We are living in a world today, Sister Wheeler, that uh, pushes back against rituals. A matter of fact, there are many churches that have been established today, beloved, that call themselves non-denominational. Have you heard of any of those? Now, non-denominational, Sister Edward said, and they call themselves that because they are pushing back against rituals, against traditions. They, they, they have a problem with ritualistic worship, they say. So they don't want to carry the name of any of the established old guards. We're not Baptist. We're not Methodist. We're not Seventh day Adventist. We're not Pentecostal. We are not Catholic. We are non denominational. And I get it. Because the old guard, the old church has used what was intended to help people have a better grasp of Yahweh. I'm talking about the rituals now. The other land, they, they've used it to now dwarf the witness of the church. They've, 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 they've used rituals and traditions to imprison the church, to, to truncate the witness of the church. And so uh, the modern church, or this new generation of church people, have a problem with even using the name church. You know, it, it, it's, it's as if they are throwing away the baby and the bath water. Brothers and sisters, that's my alarm again. It's 12 o'clock. Can you turn it off, please, somebody? Where's my wife? Grab my phone and turn my alarm. Well, since it went off, I may as well put my medicine in my eye. <laughs> We're not preaching today. We are teaching. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the eye feeding time. Yeah. 
You see why I like, I like you guys? You put up with all of my little shenanigans at a time that we're talking about rituals. The pastor stopped for medicine in his eyes during the sermon. Can you believe that I'm not going back to that church? Well, please don't leave. But, 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 but the, the, the church has taken this thing called ritual and has used it as a stumbling block to the witness of the church. So, so the new generation of people are saying, no, we, we don't want any ritual. We don't. We don't want to be traditional. And, and, uh, and what they've done is open a floodgate of all kinds of things happening in the church. There, there's no more sense of the awe of the presence of God. Is anybody feeling it? You know, they're just coming anyway and, and do it. And now, you know, and they use scripture. Now, you, you can use scripture for anything that you want a scripture to say. But it doesn't mean that's what scripture is saying. So they come dressed any kind of way. You know, body parts are showing, clothes are too tight. You know, they did, and they said, well, the Lord said, come as you are. True. But if you can do better, you should do better. You know, I heard a story of a man who, uh, he was depressed. And uh, he picked up the Bible and he said, uh, ah, they've been telling me that the Bible is God's word and whatever the Bible says, I'm going to do it. And so I, I, I'll just open the Bible and whatever page the Bible falls on, that's what God is speaking to me. So the first page he opened fell in Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, oh yes, I believe it, I'm a sinner. I'm going to close it again and open. And when he opened it, the second page went on, and Judas went out and hung himself. He said, oh, the Bible is telling me that I'm a sinner, and that Judas went out and hung himself, and that's, that's, that's what sinners do, and he closed it. And when he opened it, it fell on another page that said, and you go out and do likewise. <laughs> now, you know what happened to their brother, right? You can't read the Bible like that, beloved. You, you can't read scripture wanting it to say to you what you think it should say. You, you, you can't do that. You, you have to study the scripture and ask the Holy Ghost to lead you in studying the scriptures. And, and so this thing about rituals have become a problem in the church. It, it, it is tearing the church apart. But I want you to know today, beloved, that Yahweh is not against rituals. Matter of fact, he instituted rituals, Elder Wilson, because rituals are a tangible means by which human beings.
beings who dwell on earth interacting with a God who is transcendent, a God who is spirit, is allowed to visualize who God is and how God interacts with human beings. That's, that's all rituals are. Because you know, beloved, we are flesh. And the Spirit of God was placed in us. Bible says God took the dirt, put it together, and then <sighs> ruah, breathed in it. The nefesh, the, 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 the spirit, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And so we need something tangible, Sister MacArthur, to, to help us appropriate the presence, the power, and the peace of God in our lives as human beings as we witness to other human beings. Is anybody listening? So, 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 God first give mankind, his children, the children of Israel, four rituals. For what, everybody? God is the one that introduced ritual amongst humankind because it was his way of quantifying his presence, his power, and his provision amongst mankind. Four rituals that God first gave to mankind. And these four rituals were intended to do three things. To do how many things, everybody? All right, let's do a quick review. How many rituals did God first introduce to mankind? Four. Four, and they were intended to do what? How many things? Three things. Now, now watch this. He did not give this or these four rituals to everybody. He gave it to Abraham and his posterity. Abraham and his seed. The first intention for these rituals was to separate the children of Israel from the rest of the world. It was to do what, everybody? Separate, separate the children of Israel from the rest of the world. And we find that ritual in Genesis chapter 17. Verses 10 through 14. Genesis 17, you can write that down. Verses 10 through 14. It was called the ritual of circumcision. The ritual of circumcision. When God called this man called Abram from Ur of the Chaldees and brought him across the river on the other side. After the great flood, God was looking for a group of people that he would use as conduit and as ambassadors, as ministers of his love to the rest of the world. And he chose Abraham. Abraham changed his name to Abraham. Sariah, his wife, changed her name to Sarah. And he said, oh, I'm giving you this ritual. You should cut the foreskin of every boy child that is born to your posterity. This is a memorial to separate you from the rest of the world. 
Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 to 14, tells us about this ritual of circumcision. Now, the next ritual that Yahweh gave still to the children of Israel was a ritual intended to remind them of who their God was and what he had done for them. Okay? So the first ritual was intended to what? Separate Israel from whom? The rest of the world. The second ritual was intended to do what? Remind Israel of who their God was and what he did for them. We find the ritual of unleavened bread is called the feast of unleavened bread. And we find it in Exodus chapter 12 in verse number 15. God says, you should eat the feast of unleavened bread. You should celebrate this every year. It will remind you of what I did for you. And then in uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 25 through 27, he gave them the third ritual and that was the ritual of the feast of Passover. And it was to remind them of who he was when he brought them out of bondage in Egypt. You remember the children of Israel had been in Egypt for 420 years. And God sent Moses to go and get them out. And the Bible says he brought them out with a strong arm, his right hand. And before they left, he said, you need to take this unleavened bread, this bread that has no yeast, no sugar, and, and then you should take uh, the lamb that is pure, and you should kill the lamb, and you should eat the lamb in hurry. Put your sandals on, put your clothes on, grab all of your belongings and don't let any of it be left over because this lamb and this Passover was not only reminding them of what he did when he brought them out of Egypt but what he would do for the whole world when he sent, sent the lamb of God Yeshua, the word, Jesus, who will take away the sins of the world. And that's the third reason. The first reason to separate what? Children of Israel from the rest of the world. The second reason to do what? Remind them of who their God was and what he had done for them. And the third reason to give them a promise of a coming Messiah. The one who will be the lamb that will take away the sins of the world. And then the fourth ritual that had to do with the promise of the coming lamb, but more than that, the promise of the Holy Ghost, we find in Exodus chapter 23 and verse number 16. And this ritual was called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. You see, most people think that Pentecost started in Acts chapter 2. No, no, no. Pentecost was a feast that the children of Israel observed and during Pentecost they brought their first fruits to the Lord 
It was called the Feast of Harvest. And the Lord blessed that fruit so that their uh, crop will produce even more. He blessed it with the latter rain. The Feast of Pentecost. But this feast was pointing to what Christ would do, the promise he would make when he goes back to heaven and send us the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, you've read, said, and when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully come. And they were all together in one place. There came upon them what? A mighty rushing wind and cloven tongues of fire upon their head. That was the Holy Ghost coming to them. So, so the ritual that Yahweh did, because they were like us, they were trapped in the body, in the flesh. And Yahweh wanted to give them something tangible, something quantifiable that they can use to be able to interact with him. He gave them these four rituals. Ritual of circumcision. Genesis 17, 10 to 14. The ritual of unleavened bread. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 15. The ritual of Passover. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 25 through 27. And the ritual of the feast of harvest or the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Pentecost. It's the same thing. It just had three different names for it. Exodus 23 and verse 16. But watch this, watch this, beloved. Israel observed these feasts every year. As Yahweh told them to. But then, hallelujah, in the fullness of time, a baby was born in Bethlehem to a virgin called Mary and her husband-to-be, Joseph. And his name was Yeshua, the Savior. And you shall call him Yeshua, Savior. That's what that name means. The Greeks say Jesus or Jesus. For he shall save his people, bless his name, from their sins. When Jesus came, beloved, when he died, when he rose again, all of these rituals were now done away with because they were all tied up and wrapped up and tangled up in the reality of the person of Jesus. Oh, I don't know about you this morning, but I'm so glad that Yeshua came. Can you imagine if he didn't come? You and I would not have no because you had to take either your bull, your cow, your lamb, your he goat, your turtle dove. And can you imagine passing by your house? Everybody look, oh, there go we are again. <laughs> well, he don't done that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sister Edwards. What has he done? <laughs> he got four goats, three sheep, and a cow. <laughs> yeah, you laughing at me. You be bringing seven goats. <laughs> yeah, we all be. Uh, come on, come on. Going to. And, and watch this. You had to take it to Jerusalem. Some people haven't even been out of Louisiana. <laughs> you got to take this to 
to, to, to Jerusalem. And, and, and so why? Watch this. Watch this. The priests are talking about how, and, and, and I call it, Elder Landry, uh, good intentions going rogue. The priest decided, since you got to come from all over the world to come to the Passover and bring this lamb, and it's so cumbersome and, and, and tedious, what we're going to do is we're going to breed some herds here, and you just bring money, and then we will sell it to you in exchange, and you will have it there already to do your sacrifice. That sounds good, doesn't it? But then when the people started coming in droves and they started making money, they started to paint the animals. Because you had to have a pure, clean, unblemished animal. And you know Wall Street, you know the uh, what the what they call it in economy uh, opportunity costs. The higher the demand, so so they will paint the animals, and they will say, "Well, we we only have three sheep left." Now you got thirty people that got three that need three sheep, right? They need sheep, but you only got three. So now the sheep is going now from say ten dollar a sheep to three hundred dollars a sheep. The ritual, what was intended. For good at the start had gone rogue. That's why the Bible says Jesus came to the temple and kept the tables. And it's written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. They were robbing the people, fleecing the sheep, if you will. Brothers, don't look cross eye on those priests back in the day because the same thing is going on today. They're fleecing the people. Get up and talk about the Lord told me if I don't raise $60 million to get a jet. <laughs> and you know how gullible we are? People buy into that nonsense. And they start sowing seed. Can't pay their rent, but they're sowing seed because somebody had put in their head that God reward people who give him money. What a terrible God. Why would I want to worship a God who only bless people who give him more? So if, if I'm poor and, and I can't give like Sister Brown gives or Brother Peter gives, then my blessings are... And, 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 and I was at a church one time, beloved, where... The preacher had a $500 prayer line, a $100 prayer line, and a $20 prayer line, 20 and below. <laughs> if you, if you, 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 and they, if they had the oil bottle, if you, you want your $500 prayer, you know, you come on this line, the $20 and the $100. And you know what was sad about it? Some Seventh-day Adventists will get the $500 prayer Wow. And they weren't even faithful with their tithing off. Because you know I knew them because I checked the books. I was like, what? <laughs> that person in the What? Our church <laughs> Getting a five hundred dollar prayer line, gullible. But that's how these people were. And Jesus came and said, "Flip the tables over, kick the boat over. Let everybody swing. Let's see who's going to survive." 
But when Jesus died, beloved, all of this was done away with. And I'm so glad Amen. that it was. No more cow, no more goat, no more turtle dove, no more land, no more traveling to Jerusalem. He says we can come boldly before the throne of grace. That's why I called Yahweh Yahweh. Because I know better. I know I have access to him. I know that the blood of Yeshua has given me the right to call him Abba Father. Do you know the Jews would not say this name? And if I was in the midst of any Jewish person and say Yahweh, they will frown on me. It's like I'm disrespecting them and disrespecting their God. Because they don't know what I know. That the walls have been taken down. Here's how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15. Paul is talking about all of this that God gave to Israel to separate them from the rest of the world. To remind them of who he was and what he's done for them. And to, to, to give them a covenant of what was to come in Yeshua, the Savior, and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 that, that, that this was a wall that separated God's, one group of God's creation from the other. So he says, turn, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I want us to read verse 14 and 15. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Do you have it? Amen. For he has done what? Say that again. He is our peace who have what? Made both one and have what? Broken down the middle wall of partition that was where? Between us. Verse 15 says what? And abolish in his flesh the enmity. Okay, that, that, that thing, that enemy, that's that old English word, that enmity. The law contained what? The law of commandments containing what? Ordinances or rituals and traditions. Okay, and what else did he do? For to make in himself of twain, one what? New man, so doing what? Making peace. Paul says, he is our peace. Yeshua is. Who had made both the Jews and the Greeks Male and female, bond and free, one, and has broken down that wall of partition that was between us. And has made or abolished, has stopped, put an end to, completely annulled the law of commandments. Contain in ordinances, if you're reading the King James, or rituals, and have brought together the twin, the Jews and the Gentiles, making peace. Yes. Yeshua has made peace. But he didn't just stop there. 
Sister Mike Carter, he gave us two new rituals. I told you God is not against rituals. It is the fact that human beings do not know how to use the rituals. And they're quick to lose the purpose and the meaning of the ritual. So he got rid of the four old rituals and now in the death of Christ, he gives us two new rituals. How many rituals he gives us now? Two new. He gave us the ritual of baptism and the ritual of holy communion. Now watch this. Watch this. I told you. Oh, bless his name. The, the word says that God is a God that does not change. But his methodology, the way he deals with people, changes based on the season and the age in which he's dealing with these people. Is anybody listening to him? So he brings the whole world together in Yeshua. Now no more Greek, no more uh, 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 Jews. Matter of fact, this is how Paul puts it in, in uh, Galatians chapter 3. Let's, let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 to 29. We read verse 27 as our uh, uh, collateral passage. This, this is what Paul says in Galatians. I'm talking about breaking everybody back together. For as many of you as have been what? Baptized in Christ have done what? Put on Christ. There is therefore what? Neither what? Jew nor what? Greek nor what? Bond nor what? Free nor what? Male nor what? Female. Now stop right there. Let me explain this because I don't want nobody getting me twisted. It does not mean that you are not a male as a person. Because you got people today got this idea that God made a mistake. He trapped a female in a male's body. And he trapped a, 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 a male in a female's body. And they're, they're trying to help God correct themselves. That's not what that text is saying. The text is saying that the things that was done in the rituals of old that kept women on one side and men on another, oh bless his name, that, that, kept, that kept Jews on one side and Gentiles on one side, that kept, that kept bond people on one side and free people on one side. He has taken that war down. That's why at Berean, we promote females in ministry. I can't get the right off of that. He has taken down that wall. Keep reading, keep reading. What, what, what verse, uh, verse 29 said? Oh no, let's go back to 28. We said, neither bond, nor free, nor male, no female, but you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. Watch this. And if Christ, then you are what? Abraham's seed and what? Heir. Oh, bless his name. According to the promise. Don't add me on because you know I'm going to get half of I told you I wanted to teach. You talking about preach, man. <laughs> don't do that. I don't want to start kicking my left foot because you know, when this stuff starts getting good, I start kicking. But 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 what I'm saying is there 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 there's no more partition. Women don't sit in one area and the men sit in one area. The women don't sit and the men stand at the pulpit and preach. No, no, no. We're all one in Christ. And not only are we one, but we are heirs according to the promise that he made to Abraham. But here's where the separation.
separation counts, beloved. Baptism is the ritual that processes your transition in a tangible and public way from being sinful the way you and I were born to being faithful the way Christ has now transformed. Let me, let me, let me say that again because somebody missed it. Baptism is the ritual, the tangible process that transitions us from being sinful the way we were born. All of us were sinful. That's why Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned. You don't have to commit a sin. You were born and 10 seconds after you were born, you were sinful. Why? Because you have the sin gene in you. See, see you got to know the difference between being sinful and between being a sinner. One is your identity before Christ. The other is your activity both before and after Christ. Teach we go on trial. So you can be a sinner without being sinful. Because sinner is someone who sin is an action, is an activity. A runner is a what? That's right, a runner. A eater is somebody what? Okay. Uh, it's the act. So, 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 uh, the baby that doesn't know how to curse, that doesn't know how to gossip, the two-year-old that can't even talk or just learning how to talk, doesn't know how to steal and lie and cheat and fornicate, are not a sinner, but they are sinful. Because we're all born sinful. But when we transition through baptism, this ritual, which is a tangible expression of our personal and private decision to be a disciple and a follower of Yeshua, we move from being sinful to being faithful. Full because it is the faith that God has placed in us that helps us to make the decision and to agree to follow Jesus. That's what being faithful is. The Bible says that God has given to every human being a measure of faith. So your decision to follow Jesus didn't just start with you. It started with something that he put in you and now that he has it in you, you now hear the word for faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you hear that word, that word begins to settle in your spirit and it begins to nurture your faith and your faith begins to grow and you become full of faith to say, I am committed to following Yeshua and to being a disciple of him publicly and privately. Yes. But because you are no more sinful, it's no more your identity. You are faithful 
You have a new identity in Christ Jesus. Does not mean that you cannot be a sinner. You see how quiet you're now? Because you believe that lie that somebody said because you got saved, you're not a sinner. Then you cuss somebody out when you left church. And you try to figure out what was that? That was a sinful act. And every time you commit a sinful act, you are a sinner, a person who is sin in. But sin nerve is not an identity, it is an activity. Right. Oh bless God. Go to go to uh first John chapter three or chapter two, I believe it's chapter two. Yeah, go to first John two. And let's go to verse one. First John 2 verse 1. Mr. Backcard, I want you to be my, my reader. Not, not the gospel of John, but the letter, the first letter of John, chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children. My little children? Watch this. These things I write unto you. Okay. That ye sin not. Stop right there. John is not talking to sinful people. John is writing to the church at Ephesus. These are Christians baptized, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. They are faithful people. So he said, I am writing to you, faithful people, that you do not what? Oh, come on now. I mean, I didn't ask you to read it. I just want you to listen and at least answer. We're not preaching. We're, we're, we're studying together. That you do not what? Sin. sin. Okay, keep reading. And if any man sin, we if any man becomes a sinner, we have an advocate. We have a what? An advocate. With the Father. With the Father. Yes. Jesus Christ. What's his name? Jesus Christ. Okay. The righteous. The righteous. Keep reading. And he is the propitiation. He is the propitiation. For our sins. For our sins. Keep reading. And not for ours only. Uh oh. But also for the sins of the whole world. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? So he said the work that Christ did that took away these four rituals places him in a place. That's why I stand here every time we start worship and I say, I bear witness. I bear witness. Why? Because I want you to remember that you don't have to walk away from the church because you made a mistake. You have an advocate. We, we have somebody, beloved, that is standing on our behalf. Matter of fact, let me, let me, let me mess with your theology. That, that uh, phrase that the King James says, but if, the actual Greek says, but when. Okay, you're going to get it next month. <laughs> but when anyone sins, why? Because we are still in this world and we are affected by the things that are happening around us. But our goal is not to sin. Sin then becomes an accident. So, so, so. So you got to question yourself if you make the phone call and arrange and then you pay for the hotel room and you choose the date you're going to be there and then 
Mrs. Brown's husband and Mrs. Johnson's wife meet at the hotel two weeks later and both of them say that they're going out of town on business. You're not making a mistake. You, you, you're planning. You should question your identity. Am I a sinner or am I sinful? Because, because what John is saying here is, I don't want you to have an accident. Something that you didn't plan to do. Something that just happened. But when you do, don't walk away. You have an advocate. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ. And he is the propitiation. Let me, let me, let me give you a little, a little Greek here. That word propitiation is from the Greek word halismas. Have you heard the English word hilarious? That's the root from which that word comes from. What, what John is saying is Jesus becomes a comedian. John is using the thoughts, Elder Wilson, of the people of his day and his time and their theological thinking, those people who worship false gods. That when the gods got mad, the only way the God will not hurt you is if somebody pleases the God and makes the God laugh. So John says, since you think that way, let me let you know that we also have a holismus. Jesus the Christ who is sitting by God the Father and he is interceding for us. In other words, when I mess up, when I by accident sin, when you get on my nerve at the board meeting and I won't cuss you because I don't want them to call the conference, but when I get in my car, I start, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> See, 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 that's an accident because something troubled me, Sister Adam, and, and I just don't express it. You know, so so I get in my car and I see that beep, 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 the little beep, what you, you know, and, 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 and God is looking at me and said, We God, my anointed, the one that I said, and then Jesus said, Don't pay him no mind, Father. You know that man crazy. You know, he brings, he brings laughter. Aren't you glad we got Jesus? He is our holismus, our propitiation. He said, God, he said, don't, don't pay him no mind. You know that boy. And he's going to get home and get on his knees and start crying back because he feels bad. Don't pay him no mind. I thank God that I have Jesus who does that for me. And he does it for you. And so, and so, so he gave us the ritual of baptism. And Paul says, those of us who are baptized in Christ, we are not separate as Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, males, and females, bound for it, but we're all one. And now we have the privilege of heirship. In another text, he says, and join heirs, oh, bless his name, with Christ. But here's the difference, beloved. We are still separated from the rest of the world. But we're not separated as Jews and Greek 
exist anymore. We are separated as those who have accepted Christ and is willing to publicly declare their commitment and those who refuse to accept. That's the separation. So it doesn't matter what country you come from, what language you speak, how tall, how short, how heavy, how thin, how, how much education, no education, how much money, no money. If you decide, I will follow Jesus publicly and privately, you are in this group. And if you decide you're not, then you are in that group. Time will not permit me to talk about the second ritual, which is communion. We'll, I'll do a whole sermon on that one day. But, but, but here's what I'm saying to you, beloved. The devil does not want us to be faithful. And so he comes with all kinds of shenanigans, all kinds of ideas, all kinds of distortions, and they have used the language of Donald Trump, all kinds of fake news. He, he, he wants to confuse you and I with this fake news. So he says, watch this, watch this. He says, Yahweh says you should keep his holy Sabbath. But because Yeshua came and died, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. You can choose Sunday as Sabbath in memorializing what Yeshua did. But beloved, Yeshua already gave us two rituals. Why are we adding the third one? Sunday, no, but brother, don't apologize. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you feel it, just let it out. <laughs> see, see, this kind of teaching, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to hear. That's why they're going to wake up tomorrow morning, get dressed up, put on their best Sunday best, and they go stand up, and they're shouting and clapping, and they're praising God, and, and they're doing it in ignorance. Because that's not the ritual that he replaced these four rituals with. He replaced these four rituals with the two rituals of baptism and holy communion. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which also I present or I give unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the night before he was crucified, took bread. And after he had prayed, he broke it and said, this is my body. This you take and eat. This do in remembrance of me. After that, he took the cup. And after he had supped, said, this cup is, watch this, the New Testament in my blood. Not Sunday is the New Testament, but the cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, here it is, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. That's the memorial, that's the ritual, that's the tradition that he left with us for us to honor his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his soon coming. Baptism and Holy Communion. And I got a whole other teaching on how we move from Saturday to Sunday. You don't have time for that today. But, but what I'm saying, beloved, is we have to follow the traditions and the rituals that Yeshua himself left us. We can't follow man-made rituals and man-made traditions. Matter of fact, he says, in vain they worship me. Keeping for commandments the traditions, the rituals, and the doctrines of men. In vain. Somebody's going to wake up tomorrow morning, get dressed, go to their favorite church, and stand there 
and shout and sing and put their money in and sit and listen to a word. And he says, in vain, they worship. So my brothers and sisters, as I get ready to close, that's what baptism is. Baptism is one of two rituals that Yeshua left with us to give us a tangible experience of transitioning from being sinful to being faithful. From the identity of a sinful person, Romans 3.23, to the identity of a faithful person. Romans 5, 26. For if any man be in Christ, bless God, he's a what? No creature. All things are what? No. Passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I have a new identity. You may look at me cross eyes. Because I slip every now and again, but I ain't worried about you because I know who I am. I am a child of God, and I won't apologize for you. I mean, I would like everybody else to know too, but like, no, that's the thing. So, so, so here's the appeal. Here's the appeal. We're about to do baptism, and somebody is here that needs to get in that pool. You, 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 you can say, well, I got baptized before. Yes, you did. But did you get baptized in ignorance? Or do, do, you, do, do, you, do, do, do you know the truth now about what baptism is really about? Baptism is a public declaration and expression of a private personal decision that each of us make to follow Jesus. That's why the story of Nicodemus is just, is, is such a prominent story. Because in that story, in John chapter 3, we see three things. First, Elder Wilson, we see a, a, a private pursuit of Yahweh. The Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 1, there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and he, the ruler of the, uh, of, of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night. You can't, you can't be private with Jesus. Have a private pursuit. A lot of us have private pursuit with Jesus. You know, I call it shacking up with him. We want to sleep with him, but we don't want people to see us in Walmart with him. That's a shacking up. And I think that philosophy, Janet Jackson, was that her or, or Beyonce, the other philosophy? He, he said, if, if, if he really mean it, he's going to put a ring on. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys don't know. You'll be looking sideways at these people. They, these are philosophers. They're giving you life lessons. Yeah, why are you hanging around somebody and trying to put a ring on it? Jesus ain't trying to shack up with you. He want to put a ring on it. He want to call you his own. And he's not going to do it in private. Go to some justice of the peace. Just two of you there and you come out and nobody knows. He, he wants the whole world to know. He said, I want you to be public with me. Oh. So today we're going to we're going to bring some people up. And we're going to put them on display for Jesus. It's going to be public. We had a private pursuit. And then the second thing that we see is the Pharisaical loyalty. He said, Jesus, we know that you are the man sent from God. We can tell from all of the stuff. Who's the we? You know, this Pharisee of the loyalty is the people who, as a Landry, they're always looking to make a statement by trying to hang out with other people. They want other people to approve their statement. We, 
Jesus ain't looking for you to do a we thing. He wants you to do an I thing. It doesn't matter whether your husband, your wife, your children agree with you, whether your friends, your co-workers laugh at you. Jesus wants you to stand and make a personal declaration. Not a pharisaical, you know, when you see Jesus in a corner. It's like these people that shack up. You know how I know it? Because I used to do it. Yeah, you see how you got quiet? Yeah. I, I wasn't always a preacher. I, I wasn't always holy. But I thank God I am now. That's why I can tell the story. Not because I'm proud of it, but because I want to help somebody else to know that there is no secret what God can do. What he's done for me, he can do it for you. Doing that private loyalty. When you're in that no-tell motel, nobody can see, nobody can know. Oh, honey, you know I love you, baby. You know I love you. Well, uh, I'm going out to get some pizza. Can I come on? If you love me that much, you shouldn't be embarrassed if you're going out to get pizza for, for me to follow you. Somebody see us coming from the room. It's, it's private loyalty. Jesus, you know. And then the last part that I like is the provocative confrontation. Somebody said provocative confrontation. I like Jesus. Jesus is very provocative. Verse 5, Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born of water and the spirit. He came out. Jesus said, listen, man, I'm cut to the chase. All of this, you know, private pursuit, pharisaical loyalty. I ain't got time for that. Provocative confrontation. Jesus said, I want to confront you unless you are born again by water and by the spirit. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Everybody is standing. Everybody standing. Yahweh, I'm praying right now. I'm praying for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. They may not be in this worship center. They may be watching on Facebook or watching on YouTube. God, they can drop in the chat. I don't want to be baptized. I don't want to shack up with Jesus anymore. I don't want to be pharisaical loyalty. I don't want a private pursuit. I want a public declaration that I'm a follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. And if they are in this room, God, I pray that they will get up out of their seat and come in front of you and say, Preacher, I want to publicly declare by baptism that I want to follow Jesus all the way publicly and privately. I'm not just going to talk about what I know. I'm going to put my mouth where my money is. Or put my money where my mouth is. Oh God, I pray today for that person watching that they'll drop in the chat. I want to be baptized. And if you're not from this state, God, they will send me that number or they will call me at 504 8418 and I will connect them with a Seventh-day Adventist church preacher wherever they are. The city they're in, I thank you for this church that is worldwide, all over the United States. There's no excuse and no reason for you not to be baptized. But if they are here today, God, I pray that they will step up and come and say, I want to be baptized. I have decided to follow Yeshua, Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what my family members say. I don't care. I want to be faithful and totally committed to Yeshua. Oh God, I bless you and I praise you and ask Brother Frank comes, God and Elder Wilson comes to give us a baptismal vow. If there's somebody else in here that want to be baptized, maybe they'll say, Preacher, I didn't bring change of clothes and I'm not ready today, but I want to be in the next baptism. I ask you to just come up front. We got a lot of space. And we'll pray with you and pray for you and we'll begin to work with you. 
to exercise and participate in this ritual. The ritual of baptism. This necessary act that has eternal implications. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In your shoes, Amen. Come on, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Well, before we before we do the uh, the baptismal vows, because we don't, uh, you may be seated. We we don't vow, we don't baptize anyone in this church without them taking a vow for baptism. And Elder Wilson will give that vow. But I just want to say to you on Facebook and YouTube. This ministry has been a blessing to you today. We want you to support us with your funds. No, we're not saying if you don't give it, God will take us out of here. We're not making no claims like that. We have too much awe of our God to stand and lie in his name. But ministry does cost. We have a special project trying to raise $150,000 so we can buy equipment to enhance our media and evangelistic ministry. You want to help us? You can mail your check, money order, the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church, 4555 Fairfields Avenue, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70802. Or you can go online to our website. It's, it should be shown on the screen. BatonRouge.com and go to online giving. And I just want to thank God for those of you who are partnering with us in giving. May Yahweh continue to bless you. May He continue to pour back into you, into your family, into your home, your jobs, those things that are dear to you. Because you are blessing the kingdom of God. Those of us who are in the worship center. After the baptism and at, after the benediction, on your way out, uh, ushers and deacons will be at the door and you can put your tithes and offerings and your special project gift in it. Please write on your envelope, special project. And Yahweh will bless you real good. In Yeshua's name, amen.
put your hands together and bless the Lord. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I am just excited about Brother Frank, because this is our first, this is historic, Brother Frank. God is using your commitment to do something here. This is the first time since we got displaced from our worship service or center by COVID. This is our first baptism in almost two years. And you are that person. Hallelujah. And, and I just thank his sister, uh, Sister Marshall Wheeler, for the work that she's done for her with her brother. Amen. Amen. We're going to ask uh, Deacon Laws to come. And, and uh, it's, it's well, we're, 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 taking, we're taking him. Let the deacons take him to the pool. Um, and then we will bring Deacon Laws up. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. And y'all help him get in that water. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where's my praise team? That we need to
Now, I'm going to ask everybody to stand because we're all family of Brother Frank Wheeler. And we're standing, Brother Frank, look out there. Look, the, the church is standing in solidarity with you. Man. This great commitment you've made today. Brother Frank Wheeler, because of your love for Jesus and your desire to publicly declare and display today your loyalty to him, your commitment to follow him all the way, publicly and privately. We now baptize you in the name of Yahweh the Father, Yeshua the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Somebody says it's cold, it chills the body, but not the soul. But I'm going to tell you about this water. It's not cold. You know, we, we, we're living in modern times, and so we, we make sure the water is hot. <clears throat> so it warms the body <laughs> and the soul. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but if you would like to be in the next baptism, if you want to do what Brother Will did today, and, and maybe you'll say, well, preacher, I've been baptized before. Can I get re-baptized? Because the Bible says one God, one faith, one baptism. Yeah, but that's not what the scripture is saying. When it says one God, one faith, and one baptism, it's not saying you can only get baptized one time. Let me tell you my own testimony. I got baptized Five times. <laughs> the fifth won't stop, though. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. The first one, I, 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 but, but here's, here's what the thing was. I was no longer sinful. I just kept making mistakes. And more mistakes and became sinners and nerds. <laughs> That's why when I came, Elder Proche, and I heard the preach word, the Lord, the Holy Ghost, kind of nudge uh, 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 my, my heart again, and I got up. And I know people used to be laughing. You know how church folk go, oh, there go T Ron again. <laughs> yeah. But guess what? Look at what God has done. <laughs> So, so, so yes, you can get rebaptized. Matter of fact, I'll give you scripture for it. Acts chapter 19. You need to write that down. Read from verse 1 to 5. The Bible says Paul came through uh, a certain city and the people there had been baptized. And he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you've been baptized? They said, what are you talking about? We haven't heard of no Holy Ghost. And he said, well, then I in what were you baptized? He said, we were baptized in the baptism of John. He said, well, John taught the baptism of repentance. He said, but you can't just be baptized. You gotta have the Holy Ghost. That was a new doctrine that they didn't know about, beloved. Just like some of you didn't know about Sabbath. Some of you didn't know that Sunday is not a ritual that Yahweh gave us to memorialize the death of Yeshua, his son, our Savior. That's a lot that you learn from this ministry. And the Bible says that after they were taught that teaching, they made a new public declaration. They got rebaptized. So you can be rebaptized. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand for our benediction. We're going to call the elder who's responsible for the benediction. Our praise team will lead us. And after the prayer, please sit in meditation. And our ushers will usher you out. I'm going to stand at the door. And, and I'm going to bump 
my fist with you. Uh, we haven't been at the door for a long time, over a year. But the Lord, the Spirit of God is telling me that we need to get out of this hiding pattern. And so I'm fully vaccinated. I'm going to put my mask on. And I'm going to come and stand at the door and bump your hand. And, you know, you can just whisper a little word. Don't, don't, don't try to keep a long conversation. We're starting and we're working our way into where we will begin to hug each other again. What do you say? Amen. 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 Amen.